Turing machines are very, very basic. So it might seem odd that we use them as our model for what computation means. While we are able to construct Turing machines that solve very simple problems, they do not seem very suitable for more complicated tasks. Certainly it would be annoying to have to construct a Turing machine for a very complicated task. You might even doubt that it's possible to construct Turing machines for a very complicated tasks because Turing machines are so simple in their nature. But it turns out that Turing machines actually capture the nature of computation extremely well. Any model of computation that aims to capture the essence of all the computation that we can do in the universe should be robust. Slight changes in details of how exactly the machine operates should not fundamentally change what the machine is capable of. If I could just modify the machine a little bit and that would drastically change what the machine can do, then it's probably not a good universal model for computation. So I will demonstrate the robustness of Turing machines by proposing a small number of modifications to the machine and then showing that this does not change fundamentally what the machine is capable of. The first such example is one where we allow the Turing machine to have a different tape alphabet. The basic tape alphabet is 0, 1, blank. But we could have larger tape alphabets as well. And we want to argue that having a larger tape alphabet does not fundamentally change what you can compute. So let f be some computational problem. Let t be some function. Then if f is computable in time t of n by a Turing machine m, that uses a tape alphabet gamma, then it is computable in time three times log of size of gamma rounded up times t of n by a Turing machine m prime using the alphabet 0, 1, blank. So for example, we might have a larger tape alphabet that doesn't just include 0, 1 and blank, but also all the letters from A to Z. And we can then write something like hello world on the tape. We would now express this on the machine M prime by reserving for each character on the original machine uh, five cells because five bits are sufficient to encode each character of the larger tape alphabet gamma. We might encode the symbol H, for example, as 01010. So we would take the first block of five cells and then write 01010 into them. And then we might encode E as 00111. So we would take the next block and write that into these five cells. And so on. Now, what we need to do is, we need to be able to simulate a single computational step of the machine M on the machine M prime. A step starts by reading a symbol from the tape. This now becomes slightly more complicated because the symbol is not stored in a single cell anymore. Rather, the bit encoding is stored in five cells in this example. So to read the symbol, we have to visit all five cells and remember all the bits we've read. So we would start uh, at the left end of the block and then one by one in a single computational step, for each cell, uh, move the head to the right. We do this for five steps, after which we have seen all five relevant bits. We can store all the information we have read here, the five bits, in our internal state, because the internal state can store a fixed amount of information. It cannot store information of arbitrary size, 
for example, depending on the length of the input, but it can store a fixed amount of information. And here we only need to store five bits. Uh, that's fixed. So we store all of this in the internal states. And then at the end of this process, we know what the five bits are, and this is somehow encoded in the internal state of the machine. We then can perform the correct action and look up what a symbol we need to write and how we have to move our head and what other internal state of the original machine M we would switch to. So how do we write the new symbol? Well, we are at the right end of the block. So we can simply go from the right end of the block to the left end of the block one by one and write the new bits into these cells uh, that correspond to the bit encoding of the new symbol. That requires five steps. Finally, we need to move the head position either one cell to the left on machine M or one cell to the right on machine M or leave it where it is. If the head position should remain where it is, we are done. If the head position should move one cell to the left, now we have to move it five cells to the left because we need to move it an entire block. And the same if we want to move it to the right, we have to move it five cells to the right because we have to go to the next block. But this can be easily done. We just count to five in our internal states. We make sure that we perform five steps to reach the beginning of the next block and then our head is in the right place. So let's count how many steps we perform in order to simulate a single step of the machine M. First, we need to read the symbol. This is a single step for the machine M, but what we need to do is we need to read all the bits in the entire block, which means we need to go from the left end of the block to the right end of the block. And in this example, this requires four steps. So the length of a block minus one many steps. We then need to write the new symbol, which means we need to go from the right end of the block to the left end of the block. This again requires four steps in this example. Finally, we need to move our head position, which means staying where we are, which doesn't require any steps. But if we need to go to the block to the right or to the block to the left, we need to move five positions, so that requires five steps. So in total, we needed four plus four plus five steps in this example, or more generally, the number of steps we need is size of the block minus one, and then again, size of the block minus one, and then again, size of the block. So let's just estimate this as three times the size of the block. And the size of the block is really just log the size of the larger tape alphabet gamma. So a single step of the Turing machine M can be simulated with three times log size of gamma many steps. So if machine M takes time t of n in total, then our simulation machine M prime would take at most three times log size of gamma times t of n steps as claimed. Now, a small caveat here, what I said is not entirely correct um, because there might be an initial step where you need to sort of re-encode the input. This is because imagine the input is just the sequence of zeros or ones uh, for machine M then how would this translate to the machine M prime? Certainly we would now have to replace each bit in the input by its new encoding, which might be five bits long. So we, we need to do this re-encoding step at first and in certain situations that's relevant for the simulation time. But let's ignore this here, it's a technicality it's not a very interesting part of this process. Another potential modification of a standard Turing machine would be not to have a single tape, 
but to have multiple tapes. This is known as a K-tape Turing machine. So in a K-tape Turing machine we have K tapes instead of one tape and we also have K heads of the Turing machine, one for each of the tapes. And these heads can move independently of one another. We then have a transition function that looks at the internal state of the machine and the k different symbols that we read on the k tapes. It then gives us a new internal state. It gives us for each tape a new symbol to write and then gives us instructions for each of the k heads whether they should move left or right or stay where they are. As a convention, the input is just present on the first tape and all the other tapes are completely filled with blank symbols. And the output is also only read from the first tape and whatever is written on all the remaining tapes is ignored. Sometimes it's very convenient to have more than one tape. Uh, it makes it easier to design Turing machines for certain tasks. So that seems like a useful extension. We might think that such a Turing machine could be more powerful potentially and actually compute things that a standard Turing machine cannot. But of course this turns out to be wrong. Let f be some computational function and let t be a function such that t of n is always at least n, then if f is computable in time t of n by some Turing machine m using k tapes, then it is also computable in time 7 times k times t of n squared by a Turing machine m prime using only a single tape. I will not sketch the proof of this theorem here and leave it as an exercise instead. Just a small hint, it might be useful for the machine M prime that simulates machine M to use a slightly larger tape alphabet and then use the previous result about the robustness when it comes to larger tape alphabets to get the robustness result for K-tape Turing machines.